They said you were the best in the Parsec. Welcome to... Parsec Passion. A podcast covering Star Wars television shows on Disney+. Plus. Currently, we're covering Ahsoka, Season 1, Episode 4, Fallen Jedi. My name's Bubba, and with me, as always, is someone, when you hear them, you will regret this decision. It's our musical expert, Matt Murdock. Matt, how you doing? I am wonderful, as usual. I have no funny jokes, but I always wear a funny hat. Thanks for having me back, Bubba. I thought that this episode was titled, Take Your Kids to Work on Hazard Pay Shift Day. Oh, man. Yeah, Hera. Bring your kid to the battle. Why leave them behind where it's safe? Hey, Matt, you're already jumping into it. People, uh, there is are huge reactions in the Star Wars and the Clone Wars and the Rebels and the animated fan community to this episode four. Let's get to it. What is your rating out of 10 for Ahsoka part four? Well, as per usual, I can't rate anything below a seven. So my rating's probably not going to be all that surprising. It, they usually hang right around the high eights, low nines. Okay. I'm going to give this 8.9 out of 10, what I like to call double A's. D- double A? Yeah, that's aged down Anakin's. No, wait, wait, I want to change that. I want to <laughs> okay. change that to quadruple S's. Wait, quadruple S? Yes, quadruple S's stands for Sabine somersaulting sideways sh- shooting. Uh, that is a classic <laughs> move from her in the Rebels. So I loved that little bit. Just about everything else that she did in the episode, not so classic Sabine, but we can talk about that. Bubba, I just thought that this episode looked fantastic. I loved seeing the ghost up close. It looks beautiful. That's Hera's ship outside of the other one, the Phantom. I loved Sabine's somersault rolls because that's a big that's a big part of her character in Rebels. I thought the, the dueling sequences were choreographed fantastically. I loved the results of all of those. I loved seeing the world between worlds. Hadn't seen that since Rebels. And yeah, it's cool that Anakin's there too. I found it really interesting the way that he looks when Ahsoka sees him. We can talk about that as we get into the episode. You have infected me about the dialogue stuff. And I've even taken it to a further extreme, Bubba. I'm now looking at these George Lucas motives. Things that are supposed to be repeated verbatim over through the films. That was the whole purpose of those. Lucas has said that himself. But it's like poetry, Filoni's, it rhymes. Yeah, Filoni's getting cute. He's trying to change him up just a little bit and whatever. And I don't like it. I'm here to say I do not like that. Either do it the way it's supposed to be or don't do it at all, Dave. Uh, that's just me being a Sith and telling you that there's only one way to do something. Some other things that you infected me about the dialogue was that darn hangar scene. Oh, I mean, man. that was lifted straight from oh, the Disney man. XD channel. If you were a 10-year-old, maybe you would have found it funny, but I think the rest of us didn't. Despite all of that, yes, it was still a really good episode. The Akira-Sawa vi- vibes in this particular episode were stronger than ever, right down to Kevin Kiner's score, which uses the Tycho drums and everything like that. And I have no problem with that. I just have trouble with this kind of split personality of the score between the stuff that we recognize as Star Wars music and this stuff. One thing that I will respect about Ludwig is the fact that, yes, he did use some some of John Williams' compositions, but he brought them into his musical world. Whereas here, it feels like Kevin wants to do what his version of Star Wars has been for years, and then he's being told to also put this other stuff in. That's what it feels like to me, kind of like what I felt like last week, but it it feels even more so to me. Still, only 1.1 taken off after all of that because I can't rate anything lower than a 7. But Bubba, I've babbled enough. People don't care what I think. Maybe they care what you think. What did you rate this episode? Matt, I have gone 7s straight up on all these episodes. 1, 2, and 3, all 7 out of 10, which is... Lukewarm, that's the C grade in in some schools nowadays. We're episode four, one which so many people are so hyped for. I've taken on the hype. I am going nine double P's out of ten. Let me collect myself here. What question do Oh, I guess I should ask, what is double P's? Well, since this is Disney Star Wars, this episode was practically Poppins. Practically Poppins. If you know Mary Poppins, she's practically perfect in every way. This episode was practically perfect. 
Wow. It is so good. And I always talk about, because I've been giving out sevens, what I, what kind of annoys me about the episode. Let me start off with things that are good. You've got Rock'em Sock'em Robots early in the episode. I am like, hell yes, let's go, robots. Knock each other out. You have got lots of fun Jedi talking, Jedi fighting. Not as much smack talking as I'd love, but there is some smack talking. You will regret this decision. Hashtag ice cold. Let's go. Let's get ready to rumble. Boom, 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 boom. You've got an awesome moment where Morgan is like, oh, these ships are going to block our way going to hyperspace. Who gives a Bantha's ass? Let's light up these drives and fly through them. Hell to the year. This was practically perfect. I am so glad that you talked about that hangar scene. We are talking about some of the most generic dialogue. This dialogue was old in the 70s, you know, before Star Wars came out. What do you want me to tell them? You'll think of something. How about you think of something new to write as a script, something new that feels like it's coming from Hera, not from a generic, I'm a rebel script. How about you invest me in these characters? So practically perfect. Sabine, I put in the show notes, I said, Sabine is not going to make that tough choice. Ahsoka is asking Sabine to make the tough but correct choice. If we've got to prevent Thrawn by destroying that ship, and if it means we'll never see Ezra again, do it. I wrote in the notes, I don't think Sabine's going to do it. And she didn't. These characters are consistent. I wish the earlier episodes had made me connect with these characters the way you animated fans have. But even without that, so good, so fun. That choice that Sabine makes is terrible. The people that die in the war that's going to inevitably come from this terrible decision, in a lot of ways, it's because Sabine made the wrong choice. But mm -hmm. for drama, for a DV viewer, for somebody who wants tough questions and you know moral dilemmas, I thought it was great. I thought it was wonderful. And Matt, who cares what I think? Who cares what we think? If you are watching or listening to this podcast right now, we want to know what you think. We are both. I actually rated the episode higher than Matt. This it's is a first. This is a first. It is crazy. Our opinion doesn't matter. It's just one in a hundred opinions. What we really care about is we want to hear from you. You can reach out to us on social media at double PHQ. That's the word double. Single letter P for podcast HQ for headquarters at double PHQ on every social media platform. On YouTube, if you're watching us there, go down, give us a comment. Let us know that you are hype. You're talking about World Between Worlds. Is that what it's called, Matt? <laughs> Again, I'm uh, animated show agnostic. This was Wow Between Wow. This was really fun. But listeners, we want to hear from you at Double PHQ. Where the episode ends, Matt, it does lead into our question of the week. And let's get to Speculation Corner. Double M, answer all the fans this. Fans, we want to hear you answer it. How in the world, how in the universe, how in the multiple galaxies can our heroes, Ahsoka, Hera, Hera, Syndulla, Chopper, how can our heroes stop Thrawn from returning? I think it's almost over. Like, the bad guys are going to get to Thrawn, and seemingly nothing's going to stop from the heroes bringing him back into our galaxy. Yeah. What do you think? Let's hear your thought. Is Is it over? Has yeah. Thrawn won this round? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely not a question of how they can. There's no way. It's an in, in, no inevitability. Way. There's too much show left uh, to be <laughs> able to stop him. Uh, even if, you know, and we did see the Pergil, and obviously they True. can travel through hyperspace probably just as fast. Let's uh, hope, yeah. We would, or at least we would hope. I don't know. Again, I don't know how hyperdrives in Star Wars work, so I don't know how fast Morgan and uh, et al., including Sabine, are going to get to that other galaxy, but I'm assuming it has to be a lot faster than any other ship could be, so it'd have to be a mystical way. One yeah. thing about the introduction of this world between worlds, it's a place in the universe that is in between space and time, and so there are, at least according to the Rebels television show, Okay. So there is a possibility that by you, Ahsoka being there, she could actually walk into the place where Thrawn is at before those guys ever arrive because she's kind of traveling back in time and across space. But I don't know how far the world between worlds reaches between galaxies. I think it's only supposed to be places in 
her own galaxy, but I'm not sure about that. This is a, you know, metaphysical, mystical place, correct? Why don't you yeah. tell everybody how many times have animated shows viewers seen it? I think just once, correct? Yeah, I think it was just in a singular episode where Ezra actually pulled Ahsoka out of her place in time when she was fighting Vader. Because when that episode occurred in Rebels, it looked like that her and that she was going to go down. The temple crashed down on him and she was just trying to keep Vader there to make it happen to him. But then we see him walk away, but not her. And so we assume that Ahsoka is dead. I think that Filoni's plan always was to bring her back. And this is the way that he had planned to do it. So it seems like it's it's really important that this world between worlds is in his show. But it was only with Ezra traveling through that, he kind of got his way to a space that was similar in a Jedi temple once in an earlier season. But I, it felt like that this actual physical place was a little bit different than that. And mm -hmm. he activated a, a certain thing, a wall of a Jedi temple in order to get there. So I am totally unclear as to how Ahsoka got there this time, unless she actually died. The fact that Anakin looks the way that he does makes the glossy, me think that he also, shiny, this he might, this, powder. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, the deep fake is real, folks. The deep fake is real. And I need it I, on me. Here, deep fake me someone. Yeah, I need deep fake all the time, 24-7. <laughs> but the whole idea of him looking like he might actually be Anakin from the Clone Wars right. or, uh, or just before the Revenge of the Sith mm -hmm. um, makes me wonder because when he appears in Return of the Jedi, he's in his regular yeah. robes in that, you know, he's his force ghost. So I don't think this is a force ghost. I think somehow the live Anakin at some point before he turns to Darth Vader has somehow managed to stumble his way into this world between worlds as well which can cause all kinds of problems, folks. They're going to have to be very careful with all of this retcon, whatever they decide to do with this stuff. But I think that that's what's happened here. Listeners, are, are you familiar with the world between worlds from the animated show? How do you imagine Ahsoka ended up there? Did she get pulled in? Is she temporarily dead? What's the Monty Python saying? I'm feeling much better. No, she's dead. You know, we're going to have to find out. And guess what? You assume we're going to find out ne next week for episode five of Ahsoka. And Matt, have you seen the news? This is news that just came out today. They're not giving people much warning. Episode five, a.k.a. one week from today, they're going to be showing that episode five of Ahsoka on movie theaters, on IMAX screens to celebrate the midpoint of the season. Is this incredible? The tickets are free. But if you go to this website, it's G-O-F-O-B-O, -O, go Fobo. <laughs> that sounds like a naughty word that'll get us demonetized. But if you go to GoFobo's website, you can get free tickets to see episode five. It's going to be on the same time it airs in the United States and around the world. So that's 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific here in the United States. If you're listening in other countries, let us know if you have this ability to see it. How crazy being able to see a, an episode in the middle of a TV season up on the big screen. Incredible. That's how excited people are to find out where this season is going, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get you often get premieres aired on yeah. a bigger screen. Yeah. But never just the middle of the episode. This must really be an event episode. So that makes me excited for it, just simply for the fact that they've decided to promote it in this way. Okay, um, so you assume episode five is going to have Anakin, and that's yeah. one reason why you stick it on the big screen. Do you assume, now we don't know how fast these hyperdrives go, but do you assume we'll also get the equal to Anakin on the bad guy side? Will we meet Grand Admiral Thrawn next week? I think it would make logical sense. Why would you rent so many theaters um, <laughs> if you're not going to show the big blue guy? Let's go. Let's go. Hey, if you plan on seeing this in a theater, once again, let us know. This is incredible. This is fun. This is exciting. Why not? Why not go see it on the big screen and see how things are shaken out? I really hey. want to know from our listeners how many of them are are planning on going to these kinds of things. Bubba, does it say anything about, is it just select cities or is it everywhere pretty much? Or? It is a select cities, but it feels like, at least in the United States, like a, a good number of select cities. So 
All Once right. again, this may be uh, this may be the most spam you've ever heard of, but go to the GoFobo website. Check it out. Let's see. Get is G O F O B O dot com. This Do not is, share any personal information at that right. website. <laughs> the ticket is free, so you really, really shouldn't have to. Uh, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, Orlando, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington D.C. So anyway, hey Matt, this is all happening. Because this episode four got people so hyped. It got them to the place where they're suddenly like, oh, wait a minute. I can go see this in a theater. Let's roll. And let's get into the episode discussion here on the Parsec Passion podcast. The episode begins where we ended up last week. The heroes are hidden in the forest. The bad guys know they're hidden in the forest. Everybody knows where they are generally. The ship is in trouble. Now, the ship took a lot of damage last week. Morgan really blew up that ship. Hu Yang is trying to update everything. One thing I wonder, Hu Yang being on, is that going to help the villains catch our heroes quicker? But it didn't seem to matter too much. Hu Yang, he's the one who's got to do it. He's the one who's got to fix this ship. Ahsoka pretty much gives it up as clear as it can be. The enemy has the map. She silently, because of you, Sabine, you screwed up, and the means to get there. Because of Hera, Hera didn't stop the drive from going away. Me, Ahsoka, I'm not to blame at all. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps if I wasn't on this quest to begin with, we would all be for the better because ignorance is bliss. Right. Who, no. What... Who knew? Who knew? Now, <laughs> Ahsoka, let's get right to the moral dilemma she is giving Sabine. Now, mm. as a non-animated show viewer. I've already kind of messed up once and thought, is Sabine have emotionally romantic feelings towards this character, Ezra? Even though the show physically, you know, the show says out loud, he's like a brother to me. Matt, you have watched the animated show. If in the animated show, at the end of the animated show, Ahsoka had said, listen, we've got this devil's bargain. We can destroy the hyperdrive ring. So Thrawn, there's no way he can get back. But it also means Ezra can't get back. Right. Would or animate... you can destroy the map before it gets transmitted right. completely. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so if, if they had made this pitch to animated Sabine, would she have made this wrong call, or would she have done the right thing and destroyed the map or destroyed the ring? What do you think? Would Sabine have, or would Ahsoka? Yeah, animated have? version of Sabine. Animated version of Sabine. I personally believe that something that animated people uh, are, are understanding but it hasn't been told to people who haven't seen this series mm -hmm. is that Sabine's feelings of guilt about Ezra oh. and the fact that she cares about, you know, cares about him like a little brother. Mm -hmm. I think that that's mounted up over time. Okay. So back in that time period, I'm wondering if she probably could have resisted making that decision, mm -hmm. but now it's just all folded on her so much. Plus, there's additional things, We've, and I don't want to go too far ahead in the episode, but we find out from Balin, for somehow he knows that her family was part of the families on Mandalore yeah. that was killed. So Ezra, essentially, outside of, I think Hera is probably, she's lost Kanan. Okay. So Hera is pretty much the only family that she has left because Ahsoka abandoned her. Yep. Uh, and, and, and. I've got to, plenty to say on Ahsoka for that too later, but <laughs> she just, she, I think that she feels like Ezra is her only chance at family left. Um, so you're right. I they can have understand not got why, that across. They have not yeah. truly got that across to me, uh, a show only or a live action only watcher, but that that's good insight. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I'm trying to look at it from her perspective and what we've seen as animated viewers. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you're not somebody who's watched, pretty much the entirety of the rebel series and seeing how that relationship between Ezra and Sabine has grown from just a flirty thing to a true brother sister kind of thing. Um, then you wouldn't understand the, the show is not portraying this guilt. It's just kind of implying it to those of us who likely know, because some of that is also implied in the rebels epilogue as well. This is what I would call good moral complexity. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's Star Wars is about the light side and the dark side, but it's just as much about the gray side. You know, Anakin, you can uh, leave your mother in slavery, but which is bad, but you can go learn to be a Jedi, which is good. And so I thought this was a great moral gray area and dilemma they're giving the characters. 
Ahsoka does, you know, look to her Padawan and say, can I count on you? Like they are setting up at the very beginning of this episode. This is really the question. And Sabine says, you know, you can. And it turns out that she kind of cut it, Matt. Now, now let's get to the first, oh, hell yes moment of the episode for me. And that is the evil droids have found the starship. And I guess, but before we get to the Rock'em Sock'em robot battle, Morgan, we got to check in on the bad guys. Morgan is your real boss. Your Morgan's like, you know, okay, the droids found him. The droids won't delay him long. Balin, he's hashtag life coach. He looks at his Padawan <laughs> shin. You know, the droids may not del- delay them long, but you will. Everybody needs a Balin in their life who believes in him, who supports him. And Matt, as someone who hasn't watched these animated shows, I think Balin and to a lesser degree Shin, they are great. They are really good. I, I love it when they're on the screen. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't hate them. I don't want them to get killed or died. I, I'm excited about them. How are you feeling about our trio of on-screen villains, Morgan, Balin, and Shin? There's a lot about, especially Balin and Shin, that I really respect. Morgan is more about just bringing Thrawn back, um, avenging herself as I think a night sister. Yeah, she's kind of one and, note. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't have as much respect for her. I do respect her ability to get these people to work for her, Balin and Shin and Morak. I think the thing with Balin is there is so much that is being nibbled at as to his motivations oh, yes. that I really want to know what those are. Now, Shin is obviously a prize to some of it, but I don't know if she's a prize to all of it because she is, after all, just the Padawan and he is the master in, in this particular case. So I don't know how much he has to close, disclose, but his speeches to Ahsoka towards the end of the episode really pointed me to the fact that he is, he has got something going on that he is willing to allow the gap to sacrifice the galaxy to Thrawn. Yep. You know, it's something bigger and that's really scary. Uh, or it could be really good. And that's what, that's what I love about it is you just don't know yet. You do not know. The evil droids, they're, they're also some sort of creatures. They're really just what I would call red shirt villains who are yeah. there at the ship. On the ship, Ahsoka sees Sabine being very nervous. Mm-hmm. And re- Ahsoka reinforces to Sabine. That, and maybe this isn't the right move. Like, you see somebody nervous. What's one way to calm them down? Remind them, hey, well, we have sometimes we have to do what's right despite our feelings. <laughs> hey, this thing that's nervous and kind of making you jittery. You still got to do it. Hey, is that cheer you up? Youch. And so then we get to it. Hu Yang, why these aliens don't just fire a blaster and smash Hu Yang into smithereens? I don't care that they make a stupid choice because I got Rock'em Sock'em robots. I love this. I was screaming, wizard, you know, I was saying, Wee, this is pod racing. I loved it. This ridiculous <laughs> fight, Matt. Did you have, were you as giddy as I was for these robots fighting each other? I had that game as a kid and I absolutely loved it. I absolutely loved it. That was one of my favorite things. And you're right. Those moves uh, were supposed to be kind of samurai moves, but they didn't come across that way at all. They they came across as just, uh, just two kids on either side of the table hitting their buttons as fast as they could. Uh, but I loved it. It was absolutely fantastic. And I love the way that uh, the fact that the power goes off is what tips Ahsoka off and makes a Sabine do nothing but complain. <laughs> Matt, are you becoming a bit anti Sabine because of this bad choice she makes and her kind of whiny attitude at times? Well, I don't really can. I don't want to complain too much about her whiny attitude. I just think that it's, it's funny that, someone who's she seemed much more in control and not that she was completely but she seemed much more in control in the animated series so clearly this whole thing that has happened to Ezra has shaken her in Mm -hmm. a lot of ways and that's something again that tells me as an animated fan that doesn't mean squat to you Bubba who hasn't seen any of that stuff you know so because how can you have a frame of reference for it 
Uh, so that's a failure of the show. Well, not a failure of your of the show is awesome action. Yeah. Sabine and and Ahsoka get into the fight. The I wrote that the villains start taking some major L's. My favorite move of all of them, if you have a favorite move, uh, tell me after this. But my favorite move is Ahsoka grabs somebody with a force and literally puts him right in front of his buddy who is firing a blaster. So he gets shot in the back. Not cool, Ahsoka, meaning, of course, that's totally cool. That's awesome. I love it. Man, so good. Yeah, uh, I just I, I love all of Sabine's moves. Those were those were so great to me from jumping off the ramp, landing on her feet, doing a quick somersault roll and coming <laughs> up and firing to the whole thing where she actually just kind of rolled through the air and to her left and then shot again. All of that stuff is just straight out of the animated series. And I loved it. I love that they took the time to choreograph that and really make me think about the old Sabine and wonder, you know, what's going to happen to the new one. But there's something else, Bubba, that's happened here that I think is very important to address. And I'm pretty Let's sure hear. that uh, our friend Patman would make Ooh. us address. And that is that Let's Sabine, hear. for a good portion of this episode, uh, well, until it gets to the really important stuff, is in fact helmet on. Uh, but <laughs> Sabine's attitude is Genuinely, and this has been throughout the case of the entirety of the animated series as well, Sabine mm -hmm. is helmet whenever the hell I want to. Oh. And so does that make her helmet off, I suppose, more so than helmet on? How would Catfish feel about this? How would how would Patman feel about this? Well, I, I don't want to put words in Patman's mouth, but I know Catfish, who is um, who's been in a relationship a real long time, would still look at this lovely actress and be like, helmet off, always. Never a helmet. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned, these were the red shirts of the villains. We knew they were going to get punked. Sabine and Ahsoka realize, okay, we got to go there and we got to stop them, right? We, we, we have our moral dilemma. Stop them. Yes, Ezra's gone for good, but the galaxy is safe. Hu Yang gives them a bit of foreshadowing, and you know this is tough. He says it plainly. You two, stay together. You always did better that way in my opinion. Real quickly, they don't stay together, and they know they're splitting up, and they're fine with it, and they should have listened to the droid, Matt. What do you think? They absolutely should have listened to the droid. I, if, if Ahsoka would have taken 30 seconds to help Sabine dispense with Shin, yes, then they have so much more ability to help take on Balon. Now, I, I don't think we've seen Balon at his full strength, simply because... Uh, he only had to take them on individually. But if he, right. if they'd have followed Hu Yang's advice and stayed together, then we'd have had as heroes a bigger fight. I mean, we had a great duel between Ahsoka and Balin. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But we'd have had an even better fight. And maybe Sabine wouldn't have done the stupid thing that she did at the end of the episode. Well, speaking of, dare I say, stupid, let's take a quick let's take a quick quick trip over to generic dialogue <laughs> scene. Mm -hmm. Hera, Do we uh, have to? Hera will state what she's doing. I'm not just going to sit around and do nothing, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, but you can't leave without authorization. Hera, watch me. Lieutenant, there's a meeting of the general staff. What do I tell them? Hera, you'll think of something. Now, I know, once again, I haven't really watched these animated shows. I know that people love Hera. Matt, in the first episode, you kept saying Hera's the mother of the group. She's the one. My mom can give sass as well as anybody, but she wouldn't use this generic stuff. I mean, watch me. Youch. Is this how Hera talks in the animated show? This was this was really the kind of big thing that brought my score down to 9 out of 10. I, I, and listeners, if you're sick of hearing me talk about this, tell me that that you that you didn't mind this scene to me oh yeah 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 yeah. i don't know what do you think yeah listeners please do tell him that because he's infecting <laughs> me so much that i now i'm starting to hate on all of this stuff where i was okay with it before now i'm really not and uh, there's there's several things about harris storyline in this episode that i feel are kind of a pull down why are you bringing your kid to one of the most dangerous places potentially do you have an answer places? to that of why you bring your kid yeah, I mean, I I don't even where I go, the kid goes. Like, what's the what's the thought you think I in mean, here is mine? As we, I mean, can we assume that 
I mean, he could have could have only been like couldn't have been more than what? How many years after the Battle of Endor is this series taking place? Five years? That, that always gets debated, but I believe it is five years after the Battle of Endor of Return of the Jedi. Okay, so and let's say that uh, Jason is what about ten? Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I think that Hera fought in the Battle of Endor. Did she bring Jason along <laughs> for that battle too? I, oh, I just I, I don't not. understand Please the not. logic of it. I don't understand this dialogue in this scene at all because I strap think that in. if you're you got if you're a ten year old you go, <laughs> but for the rest of us, I don't think that it, it was even worth the time. I would have rather seen thirty more seconds of the ghost flying around in space, or better yet, have better yet. Zeb with show up in the in the fighter squadron. I love the the mention of of her being Phoenix leader. That was her squadron before the Battle of Yavin, uh, that was featured in Rebels as well. So there were lots of nice little Easter eggs regarding Hera, but that was about it for me. Okay, Just well, Easter eggs. Well, I groaned at that dialogue scene. Yeah, I had a mini cheer when suddenly she's not going alone. She's got her own flight squad of X-Wings led by our buddy from The Mandalorian, Carson Teva. And I'm not an animated show watcher, but I understand that in the last season of The Mandalorian, we saw a live action version of this animated character, Zeb. I was totally expecting him to be in the X-Wings with everybody else. He was not. But still, seeing her bring a crew of X-Wings along, it got my cold Star Wars heart excited, even after some uh, generic dialogue. So well, I, tell I you was what, ready. I was like, let's go. She is very much playing the, the card of the politician uh, with bland answers <laughs> and sacrificial lambs. That's how you lambs. get ahead, right. And yeah. sacrificial lambs, absolutely. Um, so that's, uh, maybe she's got a his, uh, a future in politics after all. Well, let me tell you, somebody who's got a, a, a history of writing Star Wars is Dave Filoni. And he certainly stole some things from Lucas he didn't need to. Specifically that the villains, Morgan and Balin, they spend a lot of time just standing around looking up at the stars and looking at the map. But like, okay, is something going to happen? This gets saved by Balin, the late Ray Stevenson we lost an incredible actor, yeah. but the way he can add such empathy into a antagonist, into a villain, when he says, Faith, I lost that a long time ago. You feel it. That can be a generic line, but Matt, you were talking about how acting can lift generic mm-hmm. lines. I think he does it throughout the show. I think he's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a terrible loss, uh, probably for this universe. Depending on what the storyline takes, Balon at by the end of the season, I don't have any idea where he might or might not end up. But this character is so good that if it were possible uh, for Ray to still be here and continuing to to do this role, I would want to see it go all the way through to the move to the whatever yes. Filoni's movie is oh, going to be. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so it's really, really unfortunate because he does take a lot of that bland dialogue that you hate and you're beginning to make me hate. <laughs> oh no. Uh, is, uh, you know, he's, he, he is again, performative. It makes a difference. It really can make a difference. In the it way really does. And are they setting up that Balin is going to maybe convert to the good guys? Mm. You know, he's watching Morgan doing her stuff and under his breath, he mumbles witchcraft. So he knows at the very least that this isn't natural. Isn't right. And they are setting him up to be fascinating. He's already fascinating. Shin, they do not give much dialogue to, but this actress, those eyes of her radiate the screen. She looks at somebody like when she's on screen, you look at her and she and her buddy, RIP anytime we wasted <laughs> wondering theorizing about, about yeah. Theorizing about Maroc. She she the hero split up. I put a note in the show notes. I wrote, Ahsoka, you are so calm. But your Padawan, who you know does not have the force, just ran off with, you know, fighting the villain who just a couple of days ago almost killed her, who does have the force. But Ahsoka doesn't raise a voice. I'm thinking back to previous, uh, uh, you know, masters like Qui-Gon and Ob- Obi-Wan. 
they weren't afraid to yell. They weren't afraid to give orders. But Ahsoka's like, oh, Sabine, she's fine. Yeah, that that's the person who stabbed her in the gut a couple of days ago. She's fine. And we have some more awesome lightsaber action. I wanted more talking from Shin. She does. Uh, uh, she gives my best line in the episode in a bit. But Maroc, Maroc, we hardly knew ye. We shouldn't have known ye. He goes down in a smush of smoke. <laughs> He leaves a bit like a Jedi. He's like, I'm done. My essence will leave. Way to go, yeah. Maroc. Is we, there another we, little Grogu inside we, that? Ma- in that, inside that? <laughs> I mean, because it's just this green mist that comes yep. out of Maroc. Maroc. And uh, there, there's a couple of things that, and granted, I am not the source on this, but I've heard other Star Wars podcasts talking about it already. Okay. Uh, and that's that the, the, the green idea might mean a couple of things. Often green was associated with the magic, as we even see with the map. Green is often yes. associated with the magic of the witches of Dath- Dathomir, or the sisters, the okay. night sisters of Dathomir. So could it be something to that effect? Um, and also green, it makes you think of decomposed things and everything like that. So is it possible that this Maroc was nothing more than a resurrected old warrior, just kind of a zombie? that Morgan had brought back to life to work with them uh, is one theory that I heard out there because well, people are now grasping at straws since it's not Ezra. <laughs> let me let me say that if he is just or was just a, re, you know, R.I.P. Maroc, uh, you know, if he was just a resurrected warrior, for a dead guy, he gave a pretty good reaction last week when he's like, wait, are we flying through whales here? What's going on? Yeah, that's true. But this week, he didn't amount to anything. He was a good fighter, I guess. If you're talking about boss level in a video game, we've seen the droids. Ahsoka easily took care of the droids at the beginning. Here's a human who at least took her a bit more time. But Ahsoka's, Ahsoka's powerful. Maroc, you're a marush. <laughs> you're a smush. Uh- Another classic Lucasfilm motive in the fact, think of uh, Indiana Jones or uh, think of Raiders of the Lost Ark when those two guys with the swords are coming at Indy and all he's got is his whip and then he just pulls out his gun and shoots them both. That's exactly what happened to Maroc. He's got this fancy spinning sword and everything and Ahsoka just stands there and waits and gets in between in between the slices and cuts him in half practically. So I I love that. Just that the. The simplest solution is often the best. Hu Yang wanted them to stay together. Once again, Ahsoka has defeated her person. She could go help Sabine. But no, she knows that the bigger mission, the higher calling is we've got to destroy this map, destroy the ring. We can't let them get to Thrawn. Matt, Matt, you're covering your eyes. Are you upset that the team split up? I absolutely am. I think I've already uh, vocalized my reasons why. I think that that was a terrible, terrible idea. Um, and I, I could care less what Hu Yang thinks. I think that anybody <laughs> should think oh, that man, two on. is always better than one. So sure enough. Uh, uh, just, just a silly idea. Yes, leave me here with this person who nearly cut me in half just two weeks ago and <laughs> go get the map. Now, once again, I wanted trash talking. I am tough on the dialogue here, but you wised me up last week. You give a good actor and you put some kind of thought into the delivery of the line. It can work. Shin, who is a very silent assassin, she drops the line to Sabine. You will regret this decision when Sabine's like, Ahsoka, go get the map. I was I, I was like, hell yes, I love a good, powerful villain. Villains have to be great so that when the heroes defeat them, it, it, may, it shows how heroic our heroes are. Maroc, he, he, you know, he wasn't that great. So it's okay defeating him in the in the end. It's like, oh, OK, fine. It is it is just so crazy. Now, Morgan, it, you know, back with our heroes, I mean, our villains, they have decided, you know what? Staring at the sky is a bit pointless. So Morgan's like, hey. I'm going to leave the map here uh, and go up to the ship. I didn't realize it at the time. I was like, this map is the most important thing in the world. Morgan, you're just saying uh, later losers. I'm going to go. I'm sick of being on this beach. I'm going to go to the ship. Turns out they could actually upload the map into the ship, which is fine. Morgan should have stayed behind, too. If she knew that Ahsoka was coming, or I guess Ahsoka is small fish, why do you think Morgan was like, no, Morgan's already lost to Ahsoka once in the Mandalorian. Yes, episode. that's Why true. Why would she want to face her? 
or maybe she has such faith in Balin that he's she's like he can he handle him. Why why leave and go to the she's ship? Flat scared of the girl. That's all. Ooh, it is. now that is a good call. And this episode, which you know, we're I'm being a little tough on at times. This episode is so good. Ahsoka finds Balin, and to me, you have two heroes. I want to hear. I mean, two a hero and a villain. I want to hear them talk for a bit. And I thought this this brief bit of dialogue and at least the attitude of like, hey, let's, you know, I understand you're powerful. You understand I'm powerful. Let's kind of feel each other out before the fight starts. I thought it was great. Balin is talking trash about Ahsoka's former master, Anakin. You know, he's like, dude, everybody, everybody knew him, but not a many people survived to see the jerk he became. And Ahsoka's trying to say, hey, I'm not here just to discuss my previous path. She should have added the fact that, you know, because we have to discuss that in the next episode. <laughs> but I'm not here to discuss my path in episode four. I'm here to discuss it in episode five. Episode five, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Balin, what do you think? Now, this is obviously speculation, and we'll probably find out next week. But, Balin, why would a Jedi who, you know, this guy is not pure Sith. This guy is not pure evil. He's trying to kind of slowly open up his motivation. He is a fallen Jedi, just like the episode title. And he's trying to say, you know, your way is death. Your way is destruction. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm going my way, but it withdrawn. But sometimes one must destroy in order to create. Any thoughts about why Balin, who is the most reluctant kind of, uh, what would you describe him as a villain? Reluctant villain or just, a, you know, kind of exhausted villain? How would you describe uh, why he's question. with the bad guys? It's a really good question. Um, obviously, and again, with all of this stuff, just little disguising of, there's been little hints of that he is seeking something, a right. greater power than anybody's ever known. It's, yeah. it's basically the way that he put it to Shin. Not in those in those words, but that's the mm -hmm. impression that it gave me. So he is seeing some larger picture that no one else is seeing on the board. And that intrigues the heck out of me. And yeah. so that makes all of these little things, you know, you, you must destroy in order to create. Is he talking about the Jedi Order itself? Is he talking about creating a new Jedi Order by oh. destroying all of the old Jedis? Is he talking? To, it doesn't seem like he has the lack of, of, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to say he has a lack of morality because he certainly has that. <laughs> but he's he doesn't seem quite as evil no. as other as other dark Jedi have been. I, right. I mean, I don't I don't like the term gray Jedi, but that's the best way that you can use to describe him. And if for no other reason than he's complicated. But I can't really place any judgment on him until I see the bigger picture that he's seeing. And it will likely be nefarious <laughs> uh, because, you know, you got to have Ahsoka oppose somebody who's nefarious. Um, but is it does it end up being for the better good because it gets rid of Thrawn at some point? Or is it is it end up being for the bad because Thrawn gets rid of him? Or whatever happens throughout the course of the rest of the season. I'm just sitting here going... It's just intriguing. Tell me more. And I'm hoping that as they're making the, you know, however many years trip they got to make to the other galaxy, <laughs> uh, because light, no matter how many times you go faster than light, I don't know that you're going to get much faster than light itself. And it takes light a heck of a long time to get from galaxy, one galaxy. Maybe to in another. this boring galaxy, in other galaxies, it's fast. Uh, yeah. Okay. But whatever, work, whatever works for Filoni works for me, I suppose. <laughs> But Balin, it, Balin beginning a fight when just, Ahsoka has finally lit her lightsaber. Ba Balin starting a fight. How inevitable. You know, almost like resigned to this fact. I loved it, Matt. Yeah, I, I just hope that uh, maybe in, yeah. we'll get some scenes between Balin and Sabine that will enlighten yeah. us to what his... Uh, because now we have one of our characters in there as a POV... Maybe we'll get some enlightenment as to what his plan actually is in the next couple episodes. Great point. Now, back back to Sabine. She is fighting with Shin. And Shin, she's been talking with Hu Yang because she sees Sabine on the ground with an arm out. And she's like, you have no power. And Hu Yang's like, hey, oh, I told you. But then Sabine, let me give her some credit in this episode where she makes a lot of poor choices, I guess is the best way to say 
She may not have the for- power of the force, but she holds out a hand and she fires a rocket from her bomb to knock the lightsaber out of Shin's hand. Hell I love that. It was like, I'm going to use the force. I'm going to use the force. I'm going to use the force. Psych shoot. <laughs> now, Shin, this is something I honestly think I saw on the Batman TV series of the 60s. Rather than kill the person she's fighting, she's going to drop the classic smoke bomb and be like, later, loser. But that's fine. You know, like yeah. the little things that would annoy me. Who cares? Let me get to Balin and Ahsoka fighting hell. Yes. She needs so a big question good. mark on the front of her uh, on the front of her Jedi robe there. A big question mark. So, and and uh, a mask so that she can be the Riddler because that's who she <laughs> reminds me of there. <laughs> Matt, who do you think would have won the fight? The great fight between Balin and Ahsoka ends up. A bit unfair to Ahsoka, because when Ahsoka sees Shin, her fear, and we know where mm-hmm. fear leads to the dark side, that mm-hmm. that broke her concentration because she's thinking bad things about Sabine. And that allowed um, Balin to snap. You know, like she sees Shin, she gets angry. She actually, I assume, taps into the dark side a bit because she mm-hmm. throws Shin against one of the giant rocks. Balin, he, t- he knows the dark side. He's like, you don't do that to my Padawan. Whoa. And he... He pretty much tosses Sabine over the edge. The wild thing about this duel and what I love about it, first of all, I love Balin's forms. Uh, (laughs) His fighting forms are just incredible. They looked great. They're kind of compact at times. Yeah, they're very wild. And and they're stiff. They're very, uh, there's a certain fighting style in one of the video games. uh, And I can't remember which uh, is it Jedi Order video game or whatever? They, mm-hmm. they, I mean, people who are really into this stuff know this or whatever, but there's certain fighting forms, and his uh, seems like I've seen that being used on a video game before. Uh, so, and that's not a bad thing. I, I think that that was a nice callback. But the the whole idea of neither of them are really trying all that hard to kill each other. All Ahsoka that's is worried true. about that's is getting true. to getting to that map. She was doing a poor job of getting to it, though. Like, I I was hoping she would have, you know, used some more guile. Well, she she did a whole bunch of distracting moves to try and get get closer and get closer. Yeah, it didn't work. And then eventually she did get it in her hands. Why she wanted to grab it, that's another question. But uh, I'd have just put my lightsaber through it, I think, if I could have. Because that's what uh, Balin did in the end anyway. Mm -hmm. Ahsoka, we don't know where she is. She's been thrown over the edge. Obviously not good. We don't think she's dead. She's the, the show is named after her, but she's not in a bad space uh, or she's in a bad space, but she'll be okay. Somebody who's in a bad space, but not okay is Sabine and Sabine. Oh yeah. 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 Like Balin didn't even try to fight her. He knew he could see into her and see, you know, just a, a few words and she'll do what I want. Oh mm, yeah. Now, talk about this thing that I guess you say is confirmed, and I guess it ties into the animated show, where we know from the Mandalorian, even if we haven't watched the animated shows, we know from the Mandalorian, that planet Mandalore got seriously destroyed. There were a lot of wars. Uh, Boba Fett always describes it as, that planet's glass. And so uh, I guess we find out, or Balin, you know, does an info dump, hey, Sabine, your family, they gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just like Maroc, he green, he gone. <laughs> uh, Mandalore uh, is also gone. And th- here's why this was a big and heartbreaking thing for me was because the purge, the night of the thousand tears. I'm not sure exactly when that happens in the timeline, but I know okay. that we never see Sabine affected by it. I know that in the animated series, she actually is still able to return to Mandalore and see her family at the time. So when he confirms that her family is gone, uh, I guess we can assume that it happened during the Purge or the the Night of the Thousand Tears or whatever they call it. Those may be two separate events. Like I said, I'm not that well versed in in all of the Mandalore. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It still it totally broke my heart and it made me understand why she couldn't destroy that map even more as an animated fan, because Ezra and Hera are essentially the only family that she has left. And so that made a huge difference in why I won't come down too hard on Sabine, other than the fact that, you know, don't do the wrong thing. 
but she did. But, man. but, but I, 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 I she absolutely I did. She's she absolutely based did. on this show. You know, once again, I'm kind of familiar with the animated show, but based on this show, in a lot of ways, she's the best character in it. But making this choice is a huge mistake, Maddie. You know, I, I don't know all this lore. I know it's a huge mistake. And Shin, who who I also like, is going to choke Sabine. She's like, I've had mm. enough of this. But Balin says no. Like, hey, I made a deal. This this one accepted the de- the Faustian bargain, so we're going to let her live. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. It, it's really it's really wild. Balin uh, is saying, I I guess he's just saying, I gave her my word, you yeah. know, and my word Who is cares? my bond. Yours, yeah. Regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong, that's my word, and that's what we're going to do. Um, which to be honest, is maybe the most Sith thing that he's done because it's so absolute. Oh, Matt, so good. I completely agree. Hey, I'm being real tough on Sabine. Once again, if you're listening to this podcast and you disagree, or maybe you, you think I should go harder, at Double PHQ on Twitter, Instagram, threads, facebook.com slash Double PHQ, YouTube, leave those comments. This is a big moment. It, it is literally the halfway point of the series, and... Mm-hmm. It is a gigantic moment. There really isn't much to say about uh, Hera and her son, her 10-year-old son, and the hero, and the other heroes trying to come in, other than it was an incredible moment. Morgan's you know, droids are saying, listen, these guys are blocking our way. Morgan says, I don't care. Ignore them. Engage the hyperdrive. And when they jump and nearly kill everybody in those ships, this show is suddenly have a, has a powerful moment that stabbing Sabine, uh, you know, this isn't stabbing Sabine and she'll be okay, you know, five seconds into the next episode. This is a, a moment to where maybe none of our heroes died, but this is a moment where our heroes well, have Some of our lost. heroes died. We saw an X-Wing blow up. Right, right, right. He, he was, you know, I, I like X-Wing pilots who don't blow up. No, I'm kidding. Ah. <laughs> but um, this this is the moment where our heroes have lost. Like, it is... This is a battle, not the, you know, this is a battle, not the war, but we lost right. this battle in, in kind of the worst way you could. That's something that happens often in a lot of these supplementary series. Yes. When you read, when you read the books, when you watch the animated series, when you read the comics, um, anything that can be considered canon, mm-hmm. um, when it's not part of the main fr- the the main part of the franchise, yeah. you often get these kinds of moments of loss, of real struggle that you don't get in uh, always in a Mandalorian. Definitely, you get setbacks in the movies, but it never really feels like it's completely out of touch or out of hope. Um, right. Or at least I never have felt that way because I was taught to believe in the Force and there's always a chance. <laughs> right. There's always but, a new hope, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, I, but I love moments like this. I didn't like the reaction to it. I don't understand why Jason's there, and I'm not hating on him just because he's a kid. I'm just, it's it fine. doesn't make sense <laughs> for Hera to have brought him in the first place uh, to me. Um, although, you know, maybe maybe the Republic is more like the Empire than we thought. Maybe they'd just uh, take him aside and say, no, you can't disobey this order. You come back, or we're putting your kid in. Oh, Prison. there you go, Matt. You've solved it. The New Republic. <laughs> child. Holding child. Children. <laughs> holding you know. children hostage daily. Right. That's uh, the way our the generals... Holonet. That's how we get our generals to do what we need them to do. Morgan um, was let, so cold let's just when come she made to that it, order, man. man. Let's just jump to it, Matt. So much goodness in this episode, and then it ends up... Ends with a WTF, where is Ahsoka... Is she in this place that even I, a non-animated show watcher, have heard of, the world between worlds? And there is Anakin. Say what you will about the deep fake or whatever. This is Anakin in a show further tying everything together. You know, this is one giant story the Star Wars uh, properties, books, movies, TV shows are telling. It's powerful. What did you think? How did you feel about this episode ending? Well, I have always enjoyed prior uh, the Mandalorian book of Boba Fett, mm-hmm. everything always has a tie to the Skywalker story. 
Feels yeah, like everything it, yeah. that's been produced so far. Now they are trying to get away from that with like this old Republic stuff that they're going to be doing in the future. And or skeleton, yeah. uh, skeleton crew. Mm -hmm. Andor is uh, out of the the Skywalker lineage until we have Darth Vader show up in an <laughs> episode. Um, <laughs> yes. But you never know. Uh, but at, at any rate, this was Ahsoka is like the bridge that can tie all of these streaming and movie universes together in a way. So Anakin is the perfect choice for this. I was much, just much more impressed with the way the, the world between worlds look, uh, looks okay. actually, because it felt so much more real than it looks in an animated television series. Don't, don't get me wrong. They did it right. They did fine. It had all these kinds of intricacies with it, but just when, uh, Ahsoka, you can still see the remnants of her footstep when she lifts her foot off the ground on that bridge and things mm -hmm. like that. Just make it feel so much more real. It took me back to that time when Ezra actually brought her out of one of the gates that okay. I'm sure that we're going to be visiting in next week's episode. So I, I think that that's going to be really fun. It was epic. It looked great. Again, we don't know how far in the universe these different points, these different portals. It makes sense that there's one on Cetos. That's an a obviously an ancient pathway. Right. Um, you know, so it, it makes sense that there's one there on that planet. But I just can't wait to see how the rest of this uh, gets realized. And please, please, Dave, you did such a good job bringing this into the Star Wars universe. Right. Please don't screw it up. Please, don't. <laughs> please, please make it ever bit as good as we felt it was when we brought Ahsoka out of there. And hey. Anakin, you know, uh, what are we going to see? Because what do you think? Is is he? Do you think he's pre Revenge of the Sith, but post Attack of the Clones? Is that I don't where think we're he, at? I don't even. I wouldn't even think of him as real. I think this is. I don't know the world between worlds, but I would imagine this is almost like. Um, how about this? You know how Luke in Empire Strikes Back, he goes into the cave, the tree in Dagobah, and Yoda's like, only what you bring with you is what you're going to see in there. I think this is a version of Anakin that Ahsoka is bringing with her. If that is the case, then it's very interesting that he is the one that shows up to her at this time because mm -hmm. of the fact that Balin was bringing him up. Right. And the fact that, like you said, I truly believe, and maybe this is a bigger discussion to have, why has Ahsoka walked away from so many people? She's yes. tried to she's tried to cut off connection mm -hmm. because she knows that that is a pathway to the corruption or corrupted use of the Force. Yet, right. what's the first thing that happens when she sees Shin? She thinks, "Oh no, Sabine!" And instantly, that connection is there again. Is that why she walked away from Sabine in the first place? Is mm. that why she didn't, for you Clone Wars folks? Is that why she knew she couldn't come back to the Jedi Temple after she had been wrongly accused of bombing it, and they <laughs> then they uh, and had, they had kicked her out, and then they asked yeah. her to come back, and she refused. So, uh, is that why she walked away from Anakin at that point? Because she knows that connections will be her undoing is that why she didn't train grogu because she didn't want to have that connection again with somebody from her past uh because grogu was evidently there at the temple at the same time that she would have been so uh i just love all of these things because what it ends up doing is it shows that as yoda had said in the clone wars and this isn't uh in anything other than the clone wars i don't think but he says that the dark side and the light side of the force exists within us all at the same time. And we have to choose how to manage it. And maybe for uh, Ahsoka, that is cutting off all of the connections. That's one of the main teachings of the Jedi is to not have connections, to not have emotion, because that's what creates attachment. It thus creates fear, thus which creates anger. That's what's mm -hmm. create, you know. So th there's a there's a logical connection to that. Perhaps Ahsoka is the most Jedi in attempting to get away, away from that as any of the Jedi that we've seen. However, it didn't work. <laughs> I, she and so, so it's thus, not over. The grade is not over yet. The semester is not over yet. Don't don't judge her just on her grade just yet, Matt. OK, but this is the most recent test and it's not looking That's good. That's true. OK, well, hey. 
Speaking of Jedi or not a Jedi, let's get to the game that only we play here in the galaxy. And that is we name a character or a thing or a, a force sensitivity. And we say, hey, is that Jedi or not Jedi? And Matt, let's go. I think we haven't done this character before. Hu Yang. Is Hu Yang a Jedi or not a Jedi? What's your rating? I think we have done him before. I think we okay, did it then, in our first then, podcast then, episode. Then cut but it. No, no, no. I think you should judge him on each particular episode. I think okay, in this enough. episode, yeah. Hu Yang is much more of a Jedi than he was in the last one. I called him, I think the last time I called him a Jedi maker. But Ooh. this time, I, I'm calling him a Jedi because Rock'em Sock'em Robot rocks. <laughs> I'm saying not a Jedi. We know the oh. Force lives in all living things. He don't live. Not a Jedi. Okay, now let's go to maybe a character that I don't think, once again, we've put in this game. Smokey Marak. Marak. Is Smokey Marak, is he a Jedi, not a Jedi? Or it, a Jedi, not a Jedi? What do you think, Matt? He green. <laughs> okay. He gone. Hey. He gone. So therefore, not a Jedi. Uh, I, I think that Probably no matter what or who he was. Yes, um, R.I.P. Yes, uh, R.I.P. to to uh, a guy who really knew how to spin a blade. I wish we'd have had people like that on our baton twirling team when yeah. I was in high school marching band because we would have won every state championship. The music wasn't good enough. Our our our, our mad. talent didn't help us out at all. That's how we <laughs> lost. <laughs> way, way to throw certain I, high schoolers under the bus. I there, threw Matt, my sure. high school under the bus as I okay. often do. But uh, Smoky hey, Mar- yeah. Smoky Maroc is not a Jedi. Uh, I disagree. He just green gone. I disagree. What do we know about Jedi? They like to disappear when you kill them. <laughs> It's so true. just like one with the force Obi-Wan disappeared when you killed him. And one with the force Yoda disappeared when you kill him. Smokey Marek, he disappeared, didn't he? He did. I'd he like killed. to point out that I was much closer in guessing that he was a force ghost than oh, people yeah, were true. about him being Ezra. Well, you know, why? He, we don't know anything about him. We probably never will. Smokey, we hardly knew ye. Um, let's get to some... Let's get to some ideas, Matt. So Hera, we already know. We've already talked about her so much. But she leaves her post. She's a general in the New Republic. And yet she's like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to go to work today. I don't think so. I'm leaving. Is Mm -hmm. leaving your work Jedi or not a Jedi? That's a good question because now we're getting – see, here's where I'm conflicted about Hera. I don't think that she's not a Jedi for – leaving work because she's on a greater purpose well it's not about her that, so much it's it's about leaving work leaving your post is leaving your post but, a jedi but it's for a greater purpose and no, see uh, i say jedi you get to leave work early that's jedi to me i 100 percent, 100 percent jedi is when you leave work early that is my saying that's my uh, vote uh well okay if we're talking about situations then bubba what about betraying the universe for a personal connection giving a whole galaxy to an evil overlord because, you know, you got a guy that's kind of like a brother that you may never see again anyway. Man, do they know my brothers? If they knew my two brothers, they'd be like, no universe is worth this this crumb bum. So I say betraying the universe for a brother is not a Jedi. That's so say I. Mm. Well, I guess I would have to say that if you are going to betray the universe for anything. Yeah. It should be for your brothers or oh. sisters in the Jedi order. Oh. And okay. therefore uh, that would make somebody who betrays the universe for a personal connection, a Jedi. That's mm. not a very firm argument. Loopholes. I do like loopholes. Okay. World between worlds. Anakin. We don't know if he's a ghost. He's part of something in Ahsoka's head. Is he real? Anakin. World between worlds, Anakin, Matt. Jedi, not a Jedi. He is not a Jedi because he, like Maroc, he's gone. (laughs) You know, sometimes you you do arguments that I can't debate, Matt. And I actually, I think I had a good debate, but there's no way I can defeat that. You're right. Ghost Anakin, not a Jedi. Hey, what do you guys think? Are any of these things, actions, 
characters, Jedi, not Jedi, you know what to do. Reach out to us at Double P H Q. Matt, we are about to go to your musical analysis for episode four. You're kind of in the in the beginning of these podcasts. You're always hinting at some criticalness. What are you going to talk about in this week's musical analysis? Well, my analysis this week does cover some of those things that I talked about at the beginning because there are some great callbacks mm -hmm. uh, to some classic themes in this right. episode. And then there is also a whole bunch of new stuff. Mm. And so I, I don't have a problem with either of them independently. Just a little bit of a problem of them existing simultaneously. An interesting episode of music from Kiner this time around. And again, there's somewhat of a duality that I'm not really comfortable with in terms of the genres that are being employed. I like both of them. I just don't know how well they work together. And this episode featured a lot of that kind of a Kurosawa influence. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you can really sense it during uh, especially Balin and Ahsoka's fight. Lots of taiko drums being used, timbrely. Those are instruments. They're drums that kind of have a pitch to them. Actually, all drums have a pitch, and drummers will be the first to tell you that. But these pitches generally stick out and really identify those kinds of drums. And like I said, I don't have a problem with it. It just seems to clash with some of the other music that happens, like when spaceships are flying or whatever. But there were some familiar themes, and I've gone over these, broke them down in the preview podcast, so please go back to that podcast in this feed, wherever you get your content, be it YouTube or audio podcast. But I'll just cover them briefly here. When Ahsoka says that if they can't make the journey to find Ezra, then no one should, when they're outside the ship and she says that to Sabine you do get a really nice version of Ahsoka's theme. Just a little snippet of the main motif like this. It's fairly powerful combining the horns and the cellos. It makes you pause for thought, the same way that Ahsoka has paused to think about what's best for the galaxy if they can't stop these guys. And then as Hera and Phoenix Squadron, yay Phoenix Squadron, yay seeing the ghost, love that ship. But as they're getting ready to jump to hyperspace, you hear a little bit of an allusion to Hera's theme. It's not really playing the melody, but it is playing the chords and you could almost hear the melody playing on top of it as it plays. That sounds like this. And also during that, you get a little bit of the bridge of that particular theme. And I don't know how much I broke that down. I'm not sure if I broke that down at all in the preview podcast. And I don't know that it's really necessary to because it's just an extension of the main theme, just kind of shifting through keys. But you hear a little bit of that as she's talking to Carson. And of course, the big standout is at the end as far as familiar themes go. You definitely hear the Empire Strikes Back theme, the Empire theme, the Darth Vader slash Anakin theme, but you only just get a few notes of it. And I love the way that Kiner uses one particular part of that theme. He changes the rhythm of the notes and draws them out into a chord that all three of the notes end up creating if you were to put them together. And it turns out that that's a major chord. And so when Anakin first appears, it seems quite happy. Now, the notes that are being played are from the Empire theme, and normally you would hear that like this. But when you draw them out, it takes on a whole different meaning when it sounds like this. Once again, it's the harmonic context that dictates the emotion. Because that outlines a major chord, we feel hopeful, happy, more at ease, all of those things. But we all know that the Empire theme is actually not a happy theme. And so if you take those notes and place them in the context of the melody itself, and so that you can hear where the actual harmony lies just by hearing the full melody, 
that's what gives you the context you get that full empire theme and there's just a snippet of that rhythm to remind us that this is not a good theme and of course if you put it in that melodic context completely it would sound like this One last thing, there's always the commentary that I make that it's good to know when to cut music out. And there was a couple of places where you might have heard score from other composers where Kiner did manage to hold himself back and lay out. And that one of that is the beginning of the Balin and Ahsoka confrontation. And what I loved is when they light their lightsabers the two notes of the lightsabers themselves actually correspond in harmony. Now, the notes will fluctuate a little bit because of the Doppler effect and what have you, but they seem to fluctuate in sync a lot, which I thought was great. And if you can think of these harmonies in terms of relative pitches, it creates a dominant chord for Ahsoka, or a dominant note for Ahsoka, which is the call, the, the need to get somewhere. And then you have the root of Balin's that is firm, that is unmoving. And I love the way that those two work together. And that's all I've got this time around. Let's get back to another segment. Wow. Well, Matt, when I listen to that, I'll be sure to say, wow, that was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get this feedback. You ready? Yes, let's do it. So the Maroc, Maroc, potato, potato. We've been talking about him so much. We got some feedback from our Facebook page, facebook.com slash WPHQ, from Nathan, who wanted to say his theory, which may have gone up in green smoke today. Nathan wrote, I'm enjoying live action Ahsoka. Uh, Excuse me, Nathan, not Jason. Nathan wrote, I'm enjoying live action Ahsoka in your coverage of the show. As for the character, who seems to be a former Inquisitor, Maroc, what if it's a live-action version of this character, Starkiller, from a video game? Starkiller was Vader's secret apprentice and the main character in the Star Wars Force Unleashed video games. Starkiller's name in the game is Galen Merrick. Merrick, Maroc. Love the podcast. Keep up the great work. Hoping Maroc is more than just a lightsaber wielding henchman. Uh oh, Nathan. This part, yeah, this might sorry part to disappoint me, you. Yeah, might leave you a little high and dry. Yeah, uh, I, it was Galen Merrick green. Did he have green <laughs> blood? Right. Did he have? Like, that might be the tell all. right there. Hey, we got some feedback on Twitter, and once again, you can tweet at us at double PHQ. Our good friend, our almost the third podcast host here, Camille, at Harley Camille on Twitter. She gave us feedback for both these most recent episodes. Episode three, she said the space chase was intense. What did she say about episode four, Matt? She said Ahsoka episode four has everything. Droid boxing, lightsaber battles, force ghost Anakin, in between the worlds, between worlds. And kids Jedi getting a bad feeling. Uh, <laughs> we you didn't bring talk up that about last that. Part, we didn't talk that about part. that. Old Jason was getting a bad feeling about this. Oh, had to say yeah. it. Yeah, but he didn't have it about this. He just had a bad feeling, which means <laughs> that, you know. He's young. He's young. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying that Hera drove a little bit bad and he got a little car sick. Oh, all. poor, poor, poor. Hey, we know what you, we know what we want from you. We want your feedback. Tell us. I have a feeling everywhere I look, people are very hyped after episode four. Tell us what you're hyped about. If you're excited for episode five, let us know. For everybody here at Double P H Q, my name's Bubba. You can find me on Twitter at Fit and Trim. That's F-I-T-T-E-N-T-R-I-M at Fit and Trim on Twitter. And I'm Walleye. No, wait, I'm Double M. And you can find me at Musical Concepts. Who is Walleye? Matt, Matt, your musical concepts on Twitter. I've been because it doesn't make any sense to me. What is walleye? Is that an animated show thing? What, what am it's I missing? It's just another fish that's not catfish. I'm very sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll hear us next time on Parsec Passion.